And that can be really important. You're reading a biblical passage and, and you think, oh, verse two is related to verse three because they're in the same chapter. And you find out verse two is the continuation of the last four chapters and the space is after verse two. And that whole section going back several chapters in the modern chapter system is all one continuous text. And then verse three is the beginning of a new thought. And those spaces tell you that. Um, uh, I was really inspired by uh, Professor Pankover's research, as well as his students, Yossi Peretz and Orlit Kolodny, in their approach to dealing with uh, the text. Um, and so I chose some sample chapters, as they did, not the same sample chapters. I actually chose these sample chapters because I was going to compare the two scrolls, uh, including the second one I'm not going to talk about, where I only had seven sheets from the beginning, and then a few other sheets here and there. So I looked at Genesis 18 to 22, and I found no variance when compared with M.G. Keter and Breuer, which represents, to the best of my understanding, the Aleppo Codex, or what we think is in the Aleppo Codex. I also referred to Professor Pankover's book, The New Evidence, on the Aleppo Codex. In Exodus 14 to 15, we have one variant. In Deuteronomy 31, 1 through 9, we have one variant. And why did I stop in verse 9? Because after that, it's a replacement sheet. So I couldn't do the rest of 31 and 32. So, so the Aleppo Codex is the most accurate manuscript of, of the Tanakh that exists. Um, but unfortunately, most of it's missing. So we can't um, directly compare this manuscript to the Aleppo Codex, which is what we want to do. However, what we have are witnesses to the Aleppo Codex. And what do I mean by witnesses? There were people who went and examined the Aleppo Codex before the pieces went missing, the pieces of the Torah. And they gave us various types of information. They would say, you know, we compared this section to this other section, you know, this other version. And, um, and so, so there are scholars who have um, reconstructed what is in the Aleppo Codex down to the very letter uh, in the case of the Torah. Uh, one of those is Menachem Cohen, who created the MG Keter database, which is available online. We'll throw up a link to it here. And then uh, Rabbi Mordechai Breuer, uh, he also reconstructed it. And then uh, Professor Jordan Penkauer, he um, then found more evidence, that's the new evidence book I refer to, that um, got down to some really fine details. So we don't have the Aleppo Codex in the Torah, but we have a pretty good reconstruction of at least what the consonants were, maybe not the vowels and accents, but when it comes to the consonants, we have a pretty good idea of what the exact letters were. And uh, what I say here, variant, I mean, well, we'll show an example here, but basically variant means what I found in, in PS3 in this Torah scroll from around the year 1000 is different than Aleppo Codex, but it's incredible to go through five chapters and there's not a single difference even in a single letter. Um, and in these other chapters, there were, you know, two, di two minor differences. So let's look at those. And then, Jaime, if I may ask a question yeah. real quick. So the, the reason behind wanting to compare what's in this Torah scroll with the Aleppo Codex, yeah. why specifically is that? Is it just because the Aleppo oh, Codex so, is the, mo the model codex? The Aleppo Codex is the model codex. That's number one. And number two is people knew it was the model codex. Maimonides mentions that people used to come from all over the Jewish world to compare their manuscripts against the Aleppo Codex. And what that really means is the later you get, the more uniform the text becomes. Uh, it was assumed the text was always 100% uniform. And here I could go into a whole tangent. I'll try to make it really short, this tangent. But there are these discussions in the writings of the early rabbis in what's called the, the Mishnah, uh, where these rabbis would look at the spelling, and let me back up even a, another a step. So you could spell a Hebrew word in several different ways. And, and I've given the example of the English word color. You can write it C-L-O-R, the correct way as we do it in America, or you could do it the incorrect way, the way they do it in Britain, C-L-O-C-O-L-O-U-R. Uh, and I say correct jokingly, right? Because it is correct in Britain to write it with the U, and in English it's not. Um, and do you know why that is? I, I heard this explanation recently. I don't know if it's true, but I love it. The, the reason I heard is, is that um, in the U.S. they would charge you by the letter when you wrote an ad, and so they, were tr so they had a, 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 a tendency to reduce the number of letters wherever they could in, in print. And then it caught on. I don't know if that's true, but I love that explanation. But then you have differences that can't be explained that way, like center, C-E-N-T-E-R in America. And in England, it's C-E-N-T-R-E, 
And then we have a town in the U.S. called Center, C-E-N-T-R-E, which is, I don't know what the story is behind that, but maybe it's an homage to the British, or maybe it predates when the U.S. spelling was established. I don't know. So, th so you have these different ways of spelling things, and it doesn't change the meaning. You have that in Hebrew, but in a much wider scale. So in the U.S., it divides between the U.S. and, and, and uh, or sorry, in English, it divides between the U.S. and um, England. But in Hebrew, it's within the same verse that could be spelled different ways. So it's not geographical. It, we don't actually even know the reason. We have some ideas, but we don't know for sure the reason why it would be spelled one way or another. And maybe it's no reason. Maybe it's just the whim of the scribe as he was writing. So the early copyists, and I use the word early um, uh, loosely, because what do you mean by early copyists, right? At some point, the copyists of the Bible uh, in Hebrew decided we have to copy every letter exactly as it's come down to us. And so the letters became fixed down to the details of whether it was a, a variation of spelling. We literally have examples where the same word is spelled twice, spelled two different ways in the same verse. And there are rules about it has to be spelled this way the first time and that way the second time. And then these rabbis come along and they start to read meaning into these spellings. They say, oh, this is spelled here with, with a vav and the other word doesn't have the vav. And so that vav has extra meaning. Okay, now I don't agree with the Vav having extra meaning, um, but it shows you that by the end of the first century of the Common Era, the spelling was fixed down to the letter. However, uh, um, the uh, final version of that spelling is considered the Aleppo Codex, <laughs> right? In other words, there are sometimes cases where a rabbi says, oh, it's spelled this way with the Vav, and then we look in our versions and it doesn't have a vav, right? And he's talking about a specific word in a specific verse. And he's reading a whole story into that vav, which it doesn't change the meaning, but he's reading a meaning into it. And we look in our version, it doesn't have a vav. And that's because there's no vav there in the Aleppo Codex. Now, the older your Bible manuscript is, the more different it will be from the Aleppo Codex as a rule. The exception to that is Ashkenaz. That is, uh, well, you saw Ashkenaz isn't exactly Germany, right? It's Europe. It's not even all of France, right? It's southern France is part of Sfarad and, and for, this, for this purpose, right? But the area known as Ashkenaz had its own tradition, and there you could have a Torah scroll from the 15th century where there's hundreds of differences between that and the Aleppo Codex. But generally, in the rest of the Jewish world, the um, Aleppo Codex was like this, this very powerful force that spread out. And as it spread out, it made the Bibles all across the Jewish world more and more uniform. And so if you find differences, that means you're probably dealing with a relatively old scroll. Um, this happens to be an old scroll we know based on the type of writing, uh, but it's still probably 75 years after the Aleppo Codex. And it shows you the influence of the Aleppo Codex in Egypt. Right By this time, any differences that had existed, at least in the letters and other things, there were some differences. In the letters, those differences have almost been completely stamped out. So, wow. All right. And, and, and possibly just because we're not too far away from Sukkot, but the, one of the examples that comes to mind about yeah. a, a word spelled yeah. two different ways in the same verse is yeah. when Jacob comes back from Padan Aram and it says he builds booths for his animals and then he right. calls the place Sukkot. And there, Sukkot is twice in the same verse written two different ways. Right. I love that example. Because you could potentially write Sukkot four different ways in ancient Hebrew. Um, and, it's, and, 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 it's, and there are notes in the margin of the codexes that say, you know, this one is spelled full, this one is spelled deficient, and, and then it has to be reproduced that way. Um, they didn't always successfully do it. They were supposed to do it, right? Um, so, or they had a different tradition that said, no, in this one, it's, it's not full, it's not deficient, right? Um, so, so that's another thing, that there were variations within these manuscripts, and the Aleppo Codex essentially, under its influence came and stamped out those differences that had existed. Maybe those existence, differences existed for like, you know, a thousand years or two thousand years at that point, but the Aleppo Codex was considered the standard, and then it had a tendency to stamp out the differences. And in, a, in, the, in the case of Ashkenaz, that is... European, Northern European uh, Torah scrolls, uh, eventually it completely wiped out the differences to the point of we're only rediscovering these differences now. Like in the last 20 years, we're only rediscovering them. Incredible. So, all right.
Um, so here's the variant we have. With, oh, and I call this PS3 because it's parchment scroll 3. Uh, that's the designation in the library. It's easier to say PS3. Um, although I find myself saying SP3 because St. Petersburg, but so that's wrong if I say that. So Exodus 14.3 has Alehem without a Yud versus um, all these uh, respectable uh, manuscripts, uh, Oriental 44-45, Leningrad Codex. Uh, these are you know, familiar things, I think, most of them. Um, L80 is EVR 2B80 in the St. Petersburg. The rest of these are the sigla that are used by uh, Breuer. Uh, I just translated them to English. Um, so L3 uh, has Alehem as well without the Yud. Um, but other than that, all the other ones have the Yud. So is this a mistake or is it a textual variant? Is this before the text had become uniform? Um, Deuteronomy 31.4 has Otam with the Vav, uh, which um, Kennecott 193 has it with a Vav, but then uh, um, Damascus Crown or Sassoon 507 has a note, Chasel Vav. Right, so it's quite the and there we actually have the Aleppo Codex. Um, now these are pretty minor variants, and what 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 strikes me is if you compare, and I've done some work on on uh, um, Ashkenazic uh, scrolls. Um, I worked on um, the one that Micha discovered, which was discussed at the last Congress, Rhineland twelve seventeen, and there in any column you'll find more variants than this, and here we're, I have I have uh, six chapters or five and change, and um, now, what about the parshiot? Let's explain what parshiot are. Uh, and it's actually not as simple as it might seem. But <laughs> let, 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 let's explain it this way. So we have the chapters in our English Bibles. And chapter divisions were invented with the exception of Psalms. The chapter divisions were invented in the Tanakh by a man named Bishop Stephen Langton in the 13th century. Um, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And... Uh, he divided the Bible based on, he tried to have more or less uniform sections so that every week in his church they could read uh, a section, right? And they would read section one of, you know, chapter one of Genesis, chapter two, chapter three, etc. Well, in the, in the Hebrew manuscripts, we don't have these, in the, certainly in the early Hebrew manuscripts. Later they were added in under the Christian influence. But we don't have these chapter divisions. What we have are parshiot. And now, I did a series called Torah Pearls, where we talked about parasha, which is a section, um, or a division. Uh, it's actually from the same root as the word Pharisee, because Pharisee is poshi, it's one who divides himself, who separates himself off from the multitudes. And it was meant in the sense for, in the word Pharisee, uh, for holiness, right? Just like the word holy means to separate something, it means to set it aside and above. So Pharisee meant somebody who set himself aside and above, or certainly aside from the people who they the multitudes who they considered to be unclean, or or more specifically, didn't follow all these rules and regulations related to tithes, and um, uh, and the sabbatical years. That's really what Pharisee meant, um, and un, and ritual cleanliness. Um, so parasha in respect respect to the of the text is a section that's set aside. And what it really is, is we've broken up the Torah into 54 sections, and, and, and each week we read a different section. Um, that was a, a tradition that goes back to um, the Jews of Babylonia. It's called the Babylonian uh, Annual Cycle. There was another cycle called the Triennial Cycle, where they break up the Torah into about 154 sections and read it over a period of three or three and a half years. Uh, that's not what this word parashiah means. That's parasha. And parasha, but the word parasha is often used in this context as well. This parasha or parshia refers to spaces in the manuscripts, and these are much older than the division into 54 or 150. Uh, when the text was originally written, there were spaces in the manuscripts, and uh, the scribes, when they would copy the Torah, or the entire Tanakh, they would try to preserve those uh, spaces. We see those spaces in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They don't always match exactly the spaces we have today, but they were striving for spaces like that. And there's two types of spaces. And why are the spaces important? Because they tell you, pause here. We're setting this apart. This is the end of a thought, the end of a section. The Ten Commandments, each one of the Ten Commandments are separated by a space, right? So it doesn't have to be a whole new chapter, 
like in our Bishop Stephen Lang, Archbishop Stephen Langton uh, chapters that we have today, right? It should just be, just be okay. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Each one of those has a pausia. Now there was a rule that in order for the Torah scroll to be valid, when you read it from it in the synagogue, the parshiot, that is these spaces within the manuscripts, also called parasha, <laughs> um, they had to be copied exactly right. Uh, to the point where if you're in a synagogue today, an Orthodox synagogue for sure, and they're reading from the Torah scroll, and they all of a sudden realize, oh, the space here is, a, is an open space instead of a closed space. Those are the two types of spaces in this period and in these manuscripts. There are other kinds in other contexts. Um, uh, in Northern Europe, or in Europe in general, there are different types of um, uh, spaces. But in, in, in the Oriental Scrolls, there are open and closed spaces. And if you had an open, place, open space instead of a closed space, or a closed space instead of an open space, then it makes the scroll invalid. Now, Nelson, behind your head, we can actually see open and closed spaces, I just realized. You have behind you what I believe is the great Isaiah scroll, oh, am I right, 1Q Isaiah A, and you see those spaces. That's in the Isaiah scroll from 2,200 years ago. So those were reproduced in the Torah scrolls. And Maimonides comes along and he says, look, if you don't have the spaces exactly right, you have to, oh, I started to say it, to this day, you're reading in, in the synagogue and somebody says, oh, there's an open space instead of a closed space or a closed space instead of an open space. And that's what we wrote here as stuma, stumot and ptuchot. Stumot are closed and ptuchot are opened, uh, open spaces. Um, and it's a bit complicated what that means. An open space means, and I'll say kind of, sort of, this, this is, there are nuances here I'm not gonna get into, but basically an open space means the text is written and then there's a space that continues all the way to the end of the line and the new text begins the next line. That's an open space. A closed space is the text is written, there's a space, and then the new text begins in the same line. And there are exceptions. What if you end at the end of a line? Well, we're not gonna get into that, right? But basically there's open and closed spaces. And uh, it's kind of assumed that an open space is a greater break than a closed space, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, these are kind of like paragraph spacings. But they definitely say, okay, this is the end of a thought, and now it's a new thought. And that can be really important. You're reading a biblical passage, and, and you think, oh, verse 2 is related to verse 3 because they're in the same chapter. And you find out verse 2 is the continuation of the last four chapters, and the space is after verse 2. And that whole section, going back several chapters in the modern chapter system, is all one continuous text. And then verse 3 is the beginning of a new thought. And those spaces tell you that. So if you're reading in the, in, the, in the synagogue today and you have the wrong spacing, they stop the reading. In the middle of the ritual, in the middle of the service, they roll up the scroll, they put it on the side, and they take out a new scroll. Because the reading isn't considered valid if the scroll doesn't have the spacing exactly right. To this day. Now, Maimonides comes along and he says, this is a big problem because not everybody reproduces the spaces correctly. And... He says, I know what we're going to do. We're going to take the Aleppo Codex because everyone has relied on this as the most accurate manuscript. People used to come to Jerusalem from all over the Jewish world to uh, proofread their Bibles. So we're going to, or the Torah scrolls in particular, we're going to use the Aleppo Codex as our standard. And so even though we have sections missing from the Aleppo Codex, we know exactly down to the, um, certainly down to the open and closed space, uh, the parashia ptucha and parashia stuma, we know what the Aleppo Codex had. We also had people who went to visit the Aleppo Codex before the sections went missing, and they wrote down exactly what they saw. Um, so if we want to know what's in the Aleppo Codex, we look at two things. We look at Maimonides for the sections that are missing, and for the open and closed uh, lit sections. We look at Maimonides, and we look at um, people who went to examine it, and they turn out to be the same thing. Now, we have a bit of a problem here. Because Maimonides, when he was copied, that got messed up. Um, in other words, people were copying Maimonides and they, put, they intentionally introduced changes into it or they made mistakes. But we have this incredible thing, which is in Oxford University, there's a, a manuscript called Huntington 80. And it has Maimonides, uh, a copy of Maimonides' list of the open and closed sections, uh, which he based on the Aleppo Codex. And at the end, Maimonides signed something to the effect this was checked under my supervision, it's right. So, we've got the list by Maimonides, 
Now we've got to check PS3 against Maimonides. Well, okay, first let's translate Maimonides into modern terms, right? What I need to do if I'm going to check it is I need to know chapter 5, verse 3, chapter 5, verse 12, right? It makes it much easier for me. So Nelson here went through the manuscript of Maimonides at Oxford University, or photos of it, and he compiled a very precise list of the exact open and closed sections in Maimonides, and then compared it to PS3. Uh, and as Maimonides would say, this was checked under my supervision. <laughs> So what did we find there? Let's listen to what we found. And, and again, why is this important? Because the Aleppo Codex is the standard. The greater divergence you have from the Aleppo Codex, in theory, the older the manuscript is. Right now, the Aleppo Codex didn't make up the open and closed sections. It copied it from another source, which was copied from another source. So you could have a, a manuscript a thousand years older than the Aleppo Codex that's so identical. You would expect that to be the case. But you'd also have divergences um, in this relatively early period around the year 1000 because they were, you know, maybe the scribes didn't know it was in the Aleppo Codex and they weren't copying from a very accurate source or maybe they weren't being that, that precise themselves. Maybe they were making mistakes. Um, so what do we find? Let's hear. If I may, Nehemiah, real yeah. quick. Um, as it relates to the Parshia, um, one of the last things, th lasting things I remember about you yeah. talking about this subject yeah. and how they relate to the literary structure mm -hmm. is I can't remember if it was in Torah prose or prophet prose, mm -hmm. but I remember you talking about how, especially in prophecies in sections of the mm -hmm. prophets, yeah. you can actually connect prophecies together based off of their breaks. Right. And this, 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 this had a lasting impression on me because you described how in Bible translations, they will actually interpret the the breaks and the paragraphs in the in the manuscripts, and they will create a whole new chapter. And so, if you're reading this only through a translation, um, and you come to a new chapter in your mind, you're thinking, "Okay, we've moved on from that prophecy, or we've moved on from that section. Now we're on to something mm -hmm. else." But what the 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 open and closed sections might show demonstrate is that we're in English. You think, "Okay, we're moving on to something else." They may actually be connecting something that was previously said. Right. That's that, a place where you see that, I think the most, where I've seen it the most is in the book of Isaiah. So in Isaiah, you have a lot of very short prophecies that are two or three verses. You see it in Jeremiah too. You have a lot of very short prophecies um, that are maybe two or three verses. And you'll have an entire chapter which has 10 prophecies. And you think they're all the same prophecy and they don't even make sense because you're like, what did this verse have to do with the next verse? We're talking about something completely different. Yeah. yeah, it's just a different prophecy. And a lot of times in Hebrew, those are strung together because there's a word in the first prophecy that appears in the second prophecy. So it's like the principle of association. Um, and the prophecies have actually nothing to do with each other except for that they share a common word. And so they were kind of arranged in that way because it's easier to remember them that way. Um, and so that, that, that's a major issue in, um, so these are actually very important, these open and closed sections. Yes, sir. All right, so now we're gonna compare Parchment Scroll 3 with Aleppo Codex, which really means Maimonides, Huntington 80. I also checked those against the Aleppo Codex, uh, which really means Maimonides, and then the information in Professor Pankover's new evidence. Uh, I'll just give the big number here. <laughs> There's a correspondence of 624 parashiot, which is 95% to Maimonides, and a 5% difference. Um, I think the interesting ones are there's 16 parshiot where the Aleppo Codex, or really Maimonides, has no parshia, and PS3 does have one. And we've got four parshiot, which are all stumot, where PS3 has no parshia, and the Aleppo Codex and Maimonides do have it. Um, there's five stumot that are ptuchot in A, and uh, seven, uh, I mean the Aleppo Codex, seven ptuchot that are stumot in, in the Aleppo Codex, which that's pretty minor. But still, 95%. Go look at a, a, any Torah scroll from the 13th or 14th century from Ashkenaz. Um, and actually, Professor Pankover in his article on the Erfurt, I think maybe one or two of them have a very close correspondence. But most of them, it's you know, numerous variants. So Nelson is currently working on um, doing this for uh, a Torah scroll in um, the, another one I discovered in the same collection in St. Petersburg, uh, which is PS, um, I want to say 15. And it is a, uh, from Northern Europe, it's actually from France. Um, and we know specifically it's from France, from the style of the writing. Um, 
And they're the, uh, I mean, is it more than 5% Nelson? <laughs> Um, I think I, I, I sent you an email recently and I said something to the effect of there are so many divergences between mm -hmm. the open and closed sections that it's, it almost seems like when they do agree, it's almost a coincidence. Yeah. Or it's a major break in the text where like, okay, you got to have a space there, right? Um, exactly. So, yeah. And that's because the one from France represents the Ashkenazic tradition, which is a separate tradition that of how to break up the text, right? So, so this is this is a major. I would say this is a revelation for me that you know I I, I was under the understanding okay they're reading meaning into every vav and every yud already at the end of the first century and so the text is is fixed down to the letter and everything that diverges from that is a mistake and here we find out that there's at least two traditions of the text one in Europe and one in um, the um, one in one of the Aleppo Codex, but the one in Europe has parallels, meaning a lot of times you'll find something in the European tradition, you'll see, oh, there's a manuscript from 400 years earlier in the Cairo Geniza that has the same thing. Um, and so, so it's not that the Europeans just messed up their Bibles, which is actually what they thought. There are discussions by rabbis who say, well, we need to go to Spain because we Jews in, in, in Germany and in France, our Bibles aren't accurate. And actually, it, what it turns out is their Bibles were accurate. They were just preserving a different tradition, but they had read in Maimonides that the only accurate Bible is the Aleppo Codex. And so they said, well, if ours is different, it must be it's full of mistakes. And it was just a different version that had survived. And look, these are really minor differences. Whether it's an open or closed section wouldn't even be reflected in translation. Now, whether there is a section or not, that could have a difference in the meaning. That actually is really important. And that's why I emphasize that. Um, but there are different traditions going on here, but these are relatively minor. 95% is the same uh, in a 5% divergence, whereas with the ones from Europe, some of them, you, I mean, it might be, there's almost no correspondence in some cases, right? Uh, it's like kind of hit or miss. They obviously weren't basing it on Maimonides, and they actually had their own lists, and we have one of those lists. Um, the grandson of Rashi was a rabbi named Rabbeinu Tom, or Jacob Tom, and he gives a list. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have the copy that was checked by him or checked under his supervision. So within his own list, there's differences. So, um, so we're doing our best to reconstruct this. Let, let's, let's listen to some more. Um, and then the Rhineland 1217 scroll has been thoroughly modified to match um, the, uh, the Maimonides, um, meaning they, they changed all the, not all, but many of the Tuchot of Stumot, the Stumot of Tuchot. I didn't find a lot of that here. All right. and, wow. and the irony is I only got to do a small fraction of what I had prepared. <laughs> like we had, a, we had to cut out like a quarter of, or a third of the slides or something like that. Because there was so much more to talk about this Torah scroll. It was really interesting and they only gave me 20 minutes and I went to 25 minutes. But yeah, um, I, I think really that this is the tip of the iceberg. This is, um, and I want to just take a minute to tell the audience about the Institute of Hebrew Bible Manuscripts Research. So for years I've had McCore Hebrew Foundation and the goal of McCore Hebrew Foundation is uncovering ancient Hebrew sources of faith. And in 2022, we launched the IHBMR, Institute of Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research, which has the objective of making the Tanakh available to the world in its manuscripts. And uh, that requires a lot of different things. Um, there's a logo of the IHBMR. Um, and... Uh, Whereas McCore Hebrew Foundation was really trying to empower people in their faith, the Institute for Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research is taking an academic approach. And I think that's really important because there are places where um, if I went uh, as McCore Hebrew Foundation to certain libraries around the world, they'd say, okay, well, this is for, this is for scholars, right? This isn't for people of faith, which is crazy, right? It's the Tanakh. How can that not be for people of faith? But they'll say, no, no, this is only for scholars. Okay, well, I'm a scholar. I have a PhD. All right, do you represent a scholarly institution? I do now. The Institute for Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research. And it's going to do some serious, it already is doing some serious um, biblical research. Uh, we already have a number of publications, not just by me, but by other scholars uh, who have been working with the Institute for Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research. So guys, check it out, ihbmr.com. We'll put up the link here. And um, 
you can you can support this research as well. So, uh, guys, thank you for bearing with me. That was <laughs> that was much longer than we planned. <laughs> Nelson, did you have any or comments or questions on this? Uh, one of the things is I, I had a feeling I had a feeling yeah. this would, this is the way it would turn out. Not only a feeling, I had a hope. I had a okay. hope this would turn out. But I, I want to I, I want to say this, and for someone who was there while you were giving your presentation, there's there's something I have a, an appreciation for that the audience won't be able to see, but I'll I'll tell them about it. Mm -hmm. At these conferences and at and and during these presentations, there are people who are um, renowned in biblical studies, Jewish studies, Masoretic studies, and there are people renowned in that room. And to speak about the kind of research that Dr. Nehemiah Gordon is doing is, while you may not have seen it in the video, every every time he he showed a new slide, every time he switched the slide, got, renowned scholars were getting up and taking pictures with their with their phones of every slide Nehemiah was showing because they have never seen this scroll. And yet they can tell in real time the importance of what he's what he found and what he's illustrating. So I think that that for me will be one of the lasting impressions I have of mm. these people who have, have um, researched and published incredible works. And yet here they are seeing things new and trying to get a snapshot, literally, of what of what you're presenting. All right. Wow. Well, thank you, Nelson. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Shalom. Shalom. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's McCore Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.